So um, I'm Fraser. He's Dave. He's Will and uh, Jim. And is it, do I pronounce it Mal Malav? Uh, Malav or just Mal for sure. Mal is easier. Mal. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, respectively, from myself and Will from Animation Centrifuge, Dave from DreamWorks Animation, Jim from Abate, and uh, Mal from Bio, Bio Collective. Collective. Yeah. Or just gotcha. games in general. Games in yeah, games yeah. in general. <laughs> yeah. So the whole notion of convergence, shared principles underlying the disciplines of games, visualization, animation, with all the things from a beating human heart suspended in midair in a laboratory through to uh, imaginary character uh, nose diving in Aladdin as the, the, the genie, do you guys have any particular thoughts or questions or responses so far in terms of what all of this means for what you are currently doing or aiming to do in the future? Have any of you got any particular thoughts or questions before we start off? Yes. Um, I was just wondering, so... Would you like to introduce yourself to everybody before you ask your question? Is that okay? Is that okay? Do you mind? No, it's okay. Um, well, I'm Jules. Hi. Um, Hi, Jules. <laughs> hello. Um, yeah, I'm Jules Blair and I do comics and stuff. And I'm interested, like I said, about graphic medicine, I'm interested in the sort of medical humanities and sort of how that works with comics. And I'm also studying animation at DJCAD, which probably should come first better. <coughs> so yeah, I'm kind of interested in the, what Decentrifuge actually is. And like, I know it's for a sort of graduate centre. Is that, am I getting that right? Or? The Decentrifuge came about um, through a whole series of uh, frustrations and conversations, frustrations that were shared uh, by people in the industry and people trying to get into the industry. And uh, without putting too fine a point on it, there was a huge rush in the 1990s for universities and colleges to buy lots of kit. There wasn't an equal and proportionate rush to hire people who had any industry experience. Um, I won't go any further down that route. <laughs> but we are still in the middle of all of the problems that that has caused. And the first uh, inkling of trying to set up something uh, that we would call the Animation Centrifuge came in 2005 when I had a conversation with James Williams who's currently head of the layout department at Sony Pictures Animation in Culver City in Los Angeles and James and I first came to know one another through a software company. Uh, I worked for two years as head of training for uh, Cambridge Animation Systems uh, so when Disney were making Little Mermaid and uh, Rescuers Down Under. That was the beginning of the digitization of the line artwork and the digi digitization of the ink and paint process and the camera and compositing processes. But the software that allowed that to happen belonged exclusively to Disney. Um, when I was working at Cambridge Animation Systems, there were companies in America, France, the UK, all rushing to try and develop caps that you could buy in the supermarket because the system Disney developed was called CAPS, Com Computer Aided Production System. James and I were both uh, involved in production for television, in uh, him in Munich and me in London with that system. And when Warner Brothers got moving to try and compete with Disney by going into feature production with Space Jam, they bought the Animo system and at the same time DreamWorks bought it to do uh, uh, Prince of Egypt. So James and I, in very, very rapid succession, found ourselves m sort of whisked off to Los Angeles, where I met Dave a couple of years later on Tarzan. Uh, actually, I met Dave when I first went over there. It's another story. Um, <laughs> so the conversation in 2005, I finished work at Disney in 1999, and I was back in the UK, and my phone was ringing, and people were saying, yeah, I, we, we see in the yellow pages that you're opening an animation company in Edinburgh, uh, which never got off the ground, by the way. Um, so we bought a whole bunch of Maya licenses and we've switched it on. I don't know, there's no films coming out at the other end. I really, we don't, can you, can you come in and explain why? So I would then go into the colleges and kind of go, well, yeah, it's not, that's not what makes the films. When you sit down at the computer, you need to know what the computer wants you to do. I was lucky enough when I was uh, here in Dundee doing teaching work to be introduced to Brian Robinson at the University of Aberté. And he said, well, we've got this situation here where Aberté can't really, we, we do games. We're not really allowed to do film or TV animation because that's what Duncan and Jordanson does. 
Uh, again, you know, tweet this as much as you like. I think that's nuts. I think wherever you are and wherever what you're doing, these things relate to one another. I have absolutely no idea who's behind that territorial thinking. Somebody please find them and give them another job. Um, <laughs> but the whole issue there was that they had a 10-week summer initiative called Dare to be Digital. How many of you have been through it or have been involved in it? Or Dare to be Digital kicks ass. And Jackie uh, McKenzie, who uh, piloted the whole thing, created a situation in which for 10 weeks in the summer, and the summer is a great time for academic institutions to make use of downtime and uh, technical skill and availability of machines and stuff. But what they also can do is throw the doors open to industry. So the 10-week format for Dare to be Digital was that you got 10 weeks in which to, as teams, develop a, prototype, a working prototype for a game. You got input from Sony, input from Electronic Arts. And as soon as I was hired to be a mentor for uh, animation and, and design on Dare, uh, I kept saying to people, this is the best way to do this. If we can do this for games, we can do this for film and TV animation too. And there was just this kind of like tumbleweed, whoosh, what's wrong with you? That's games, that's the movie industry. Eleven years later, we finally managed to get somebody to go, well, couldn't you do something in the summer? And we blew the dust off it and that's where, where we took it. But the centrifuge, the, the idea that came through all of that, um, when I was talking to James in 2005, he had only recently started work at Sony, and his response to the frustrations I voiced about trying to share the knowledge and experience that you've got from the industry in an academic context where they just don't recognize that it's an industrial process. So you're, you're simultaneously wanted on campus so they can say, oh, we had a guy from Disney here last week. And then when you say, well, if you want these guys to go out and get hired by Disney, really, you need to be teaching this. And they'd be like, la, 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 I can't hear you. <laughs> Sony had got to such a stage of pissed offness and frustration with that themselves. Not just, this is not a local problem. This is a problem in America. It's a problem in Europe. It's a problem in Canada and France. And they were say, said to James Knight, if you ever get to the point of being able to get this summer thing to happen, uh, let us know and we'll, be, we'll stand beside you, behind you to do that. But the centrifuge also has this uh, dual purpose thing where we've, we've managed to do the base camp once. We did that in July and August. We're trying very hard to make it that it'll be an annual thing. But the other idea behind it was that it would be a dating agency. So that people in the industry who come to the end of a project or the end of a contract and go, you know, I'm, I've just come off of Trolls. Uh, and this, was a, this physically happened in September. Yes. Dave and I were hanging out in Soho and he was like, you know, Mel and the kids and I didn't get to take a summer holiday. We were so busy on crunch time and trolls. Dave was meant to come to a festival in Norway in March. He couldn't because he was too busy because they backed up and all this stuff. So, but I'm going to take December off. And then Will and I got called in to speak to the guys at Axis. And they went, we'd really like some input on character animation. Do you know anybody? And was like, hold on, you know, <laughs> and just, just managed, you know, we'd be lucky to get Dave again. You know, it, it'll be another couple of years before, you know, whatever... Dave's next project is, you know, these things take time. So there was that wonderful window of opportunity. So the centrifuge is the idea it's, it, that it's the people who want to get into any area of skill uh, in creative, technical, or managerial side of any area of animation or moving image communi communication. If they come to the one side of the website and say, we need somebody who's good on rigging, we need somebody who's good on cinematography, we don't understand about production management or budgeting or whatever, then if we've got other people knocking on the other door and going, I've actually just finished the production accountant on this and I've got three months of not doing anything, can I do some work for workshops for you? And then juggle it. And the great genius thing at the moment is I'm not doing any of this, he's doing all the work. <laughs> so, but that's it. The idea is so that it's a, an annual industry-based training opportunity for a group of people that are... Uh, kind of recruited and then a yeah. uh, kind of year round. We're also, as well as the workshops, we're also looking to set up a mentoring system so you'll be able to go online once the website's sorted, which is still a way off yet. And again, people from industry will be able to say, well, I'd like to mentor someone. You can sign up for a small fee. They'll look at portfolios, go through, pick someone to mentor, and then you'll sign up to a kind of once fortnightly, hour long session with them for six months or something like that. So you can get feedback whilst you're studying or early in your career with people who are working in the industry, basically. Well, the idea is to go to where the, be the examples of best practice are in physical and online training and teaching and handing on of, uh, of information and steal it, copy it, <laughs> do it. So we're stealing elements of 
Uh, I mean, everything that we did with Sony in the summer, the entire thing was done by con <coughs> conference call, apart from a few people locally and internationally who happened to be in Glasgow who dropped in to share their experience. But the other thing that the centrifuge that, that we're hoping to do also is make it that we, we take part in events and initiatives like this that, that remind people that the entertainment industry actually feeds off and feeds into all these other areas because you want good quality moving image communication, whether you're working in games, television, web design, or, or whatever. And you know, we've got all this really kind of important life-saving stuff going on and the notion that when people are learning and developing those skills, that there is a real life application as well as a fantasy application for it is, is kind of a cool thing. And if we can encourage that, that's I think cool. it's an interesting point in terms of that blurring between fantasy and reality. There was, um, I don't know if any of you saw Frankie Boyle's American, some kind of review autopsy. kind of thing. Yeah, American autopsy. And there was a guy on that defending Hollywood saying, no, he, he thought that actually the kind of media for America is actually making the world a better place in terms of kind of educating people in a kind of way that's making them think about being nicer people, you know? And I'd, that might be a far stretch, but I think a movie like Trolls, that kids come away from that with a sense of how to be a better person. So I think, and it's in many ways, I think it's, it's kind of taken on the role of perhaps churches and things like that. They used to... So I don't know if anyone else got any in, thoughts on that. In games, when you think of something, uh, you were talking about Little Big Planet. When I was researching the book and I was talking to the design team on Little Big Planet, one of the things that had occurred to me and that I had a conversation with them about was that here was a technology where it would apply in the area of teaching languages because you had this international online community of people who were kind of communicating through <coughs> physical objects and uh, problem solving and animation and stuff like that. Do you find that there's a great deal of discussion or conversation or initiative taking at the moment in the area of how, how games can expand uh, or, or further develop what they do in, in, in the real world as well as the yeah. virtual? I think uh, we're currently at the moment, internationally speaking, there's quite a growing indie scene within the games development community, mostly as a result of the accessibility of tools that made the process much, much easier than before. Uh, and as a result, you get a lot more people, a more kind of people with interesting backgrounds making games, not necessarily people who you, you know who are gamers as such. People who are kind of using it as a way to kind of you know create art essentially. Um, and that's what we're doing ourselves actually, a biome collective in Dundee. So we've kind of <coughs> set up a collective, um, so it's a new kind of model of working, more more kind of collaborative way. Um, generally speaking, in the games industry is very much you know we're a silo. We make games. And there's a reason for that. It's a very technically challenging process. It's a very expensive process. Um, but as, this, as it gets more accessible, you get more and more people coming into it who aren't necessarily very technical, for example, uh, which actually means we get a lot more interesting stories being told, a lot more interesting interactions. Um, so the stuff I've been doing in Dundee for the past few years, I've, I've collaborated with the National Theatre of Scotland, for example, on a walking tour game based on a movie franchise, right? And then last year we did Killbox, which is an art installation about drone warfare. So it's kind of a 10 minute, 10 minute experience. And in all these, um, in all these experiences, because I'm, I'm generally a visual artist, I'll kind of apply animation whenever possible, because you know, it's a great way to communicate. Um, so we're finding it more and more within games that you know, collaboration, especially cross-sector stuff, is happening all the time. So it's a very good time to actually make stuff. And Jim, do you, have you found that the response to when you do presentations of this kind and when people begin to see information about all the things that you were talking about, which if you were listening to it on Radio 4 and it was a non-visual form of communication, I don't know that I would get 15 seconds into it. But when I'm able to follow what you're describing about the um, structure of the cells and about the circulatory systems, do you find that you look at a, an audience of people from outside the medical profession and you see the imaginary light bulbs going on over the head when they see the visuals, or? I think, I, I nearly shared this when I spoke. Um, I, I was going to the same conference for about f for four years running, and I gave three talks that related to some of the computational modeling we were doing, and some of the results that came out of that. The fourth time I went, which was just last, uh, last June, I actually presented this bit of work that I've just shown you now, obviously in a slightly different context. And a couple of people said to me afterwards, because they'd also been to the previous three talks, for the first time they'd understood what I was talking about. 
So I don't know whether that says more about the power of the visuals or, or, or my poor presentation. Um, I, I hope it was a bit of both, uh, in, in, in that you know, the visuals have, have helped a lot. I think, I think what the visuals do do is offer a degree of laterality across different discipline areas. So um, I used to work in soil science, which is a slightly bizarre shift. So with sort of background in computing into plants and fungi and how fungi grow through soil and then into cancer. Um, and we used to look at soil structure, we used to scan it in 3D uh, and build models of, of, of how to measure that 3D structure. And when I then saw, for the first time, a 3D scan of a, of a cancer tumour, I was immediately switched on, not through the nature of the problem, but because the picture looked the same. And that we actually brought some of the algorithms that we used to characterise soil science to better understand how tumours grow and develop over time. So I think that as, uh, uh, you know, the role of those, of those visuals is to really break down those discipline silos, because people think visually, none non better than the people in this room, but actually the rest of the world thinks primarily in terms of pictures and processes and how things change. And so finding <coughs> ways to, to you know, display that is probably one of the key elements that, that will unlock scientific thinking. I was quite struck by what you said about the uncanny valley and its origins are not in animation. They're in, robotics. yeah, they're in robotics, which is pretty hard engineering. Um, and so, you know, and really a thing going forward is keep your eyes wide open about where lessons can be learned in other areas and how that bleeds over. I don't know. I think that was the thing I found interesting. Yes, I, I kind of l laughed when you made the uh, reference to the Manamana sequence with the Muppets, mm -hmm. because uh, there's a whole group of guys in Salzburg that I, I picked up that, that specific sequence to try and pull people away from the idea that when you're designing characters, because early on, particularly in games like Final Fantasy, there was this big selling point about the spirits within. It was the first kind of photorealistic CG movie and Final Fantasy Spirits Within and Polar Express. Even the people who worked on Polar Express, including my friend James, referred to it as Arctic zombies while they were working on it. <laughs> but that notion of having something that has really just the fundamentals of puppetry, the, a, a lot of what you're doing in, in, in animation is tapping into make-believe tapping into the fact that an audience turns up at, at a cinema or switches on the television or, or, or boots up a game wanting to believe that and quite prepared to buy into the most ridiculous reductions in terms of detail or, or whatever. They're, you're not looking for real. You're looking, it was the Disney thing about the plausible impossible. Yeah. It's not reality. It's not realism. It's believability. And I guess... Well, one of the things that um, I learned again from Chuck Jones was when he did... Remember... Um, what is it, uh, Broomstick Bunny? When Bugs Bunny is having that interaction with Witch Hazel, and um, she does this thing when she exits, and she goes, hee hee hee, and she jumps up and she clicks her heels, and then she's gone in one frame, but her bobby pins stay behind, and they, f they spin in real time, and they drop in real physics. So because there's that thing that grounds what you just saw, which is completely unbelievable, you totally buy it. And I love that. I love that you can, you know, take those different aspects of things and, you know, mush them together. How many of you have, have, have an interest in audio for games or uh, animation or anybody interested in audio and music? <coughs> music, yes. Music, yes. Audio, no. Yeah. <laughs> Char Charles, Charlie Grosvenor, who wrote the Hanna-Barbera in-house uh, animation layout guide, when I met with him and I said, oh, the only time I was ever in the old Hanna-Barbera building in Coenga Boulevard, we were in the basement room where they had stored all of the original sound effects for the Flintstones, the Jetsons, Scooby-Doo and all that. And he went, oh, you mean the bongo zip-outs? And I said, what's a bongo zip-out? And he said, it's the... <laughs> and it, it got me onto a whole train of thinking that the guys that were designing and animating Hanna-Barbera, when you moved from that thing of going into a cinema making your decision outside the building. I'm going to walk in there, sit in the dark, concentrate on that film. When it moved over to people watching animation on a 12-inch screen in the corner of their living room, not only did they have to change to the scale of the image, 
But they had to accept the fact that while people were watching Fred and Barney doing what they do in the Flintstones, they might also be on the telephone or cooking dinner or letting the kids in from the door at school. So the bongo zip outs are an audio way of telling you Fred left the kitchen even if you're not looking at the screen. So a lot of the, that business of what, because one of the things that people raise as a scary vision of the future, you see all these photographs of kids with Oculus Rift, that, you know, all sitting in a room like this, like there. But actually, once you yourself put on one of those headsets, which I did for the first time last month in somebody's kitchen in Norway, you're gone, you're sold. This whole idea that you're into a world, and it's that idea that you, as designers or animators, are going for that thing that you know exists in the audience, that they want to believe and they want to understand and they want to identify. Well, the, the Oculus Rift thing, I think the virtual reality is, is a really big thing right now. There's a lot of companies that are putting a lot of time and effort into that technology and what it's capable of. Um, I mean, it seems like, you know, games is like a no-brainer. That would be so much nicer to have actual 3D characters that you can, and environments that you can experience rather than just that one, you know, kind of flat, unidirectional thing. Um, I'm still really a little curious about how you can possibly make that kind of environment work in a narrative. Because you need to guide the audience through the story, well, right? I've been seeing some of those recently, so the, um, the, some of the Google ones, what they do is the character leaves screen and the animation plays in a loop, it pauses until you catch up. So you can look around as much as you want and then you catch up the character and keep going. Um, I saw at CTN there was a, some folk had made a horror movie and the way they got around the fact that they couldn't have everyone walking around was you play the character tied to a chair. <laughs> so you sat and watch this horror movie. And I think it, so if you're in a cockpit or something, it works fine. But then if you're in the house and you're exploring a big landscape, it becomes problematic. So I think it's becoming more of a kind of theme park thing where they've got custom built spaces you can wander around. And well, there used to be, a um, long time ago in Los Angeles, there was this play called Tamara. And it was based on the life, sort of loosely, of Tamara de Lempicka, this Italian yeah. artist. Yeah. The art Deco. Do you guys know that Tamara de Lempicka, the very big, big heroic Art yeah. Deco Beautiful portrait? Beautiful stuff. Anyway, the, the, the play took place in a mansion, and there were eight characters, and it happened simultaneously in real time, and you could follow whichever character you wanted. And if you wanted to see the entire play, you had to come back eight times. <laughs> but each, each story, was compelling on its own. But to get the full picture, you needed to, to do it all. So that's the thing like to me that could be interesting about the whole VR experience is if there's enough stuff going on that you can go down those rabbit holes and it's still entertaining and interesting and you don't lose the major thread, then it might play that's out. That's been a form of theater since the Middle Ages because if you look at the mystery plays and you look at what happens every Easter in Oberammergau where they go through the, the Stations of the Cross, that idea that you, you, I guess the question is not so much how you follow the action or how you see it or how you divide it up, but whether or not you as an audience member interact with it and affect the narrative, <laughs> whether there's a, an interruption or a, a, an influence on the narrative. But the Well, I, I gotta say though, like to me, I think it's fascinating and I, there's tons and tons of great things, but as a director, I would really struggle with the lack of control. Because you want to drive the audience through an experience. And if the audience is driving themselves and they're doing little loop-de-loops and little side turns and stuff, you've lost all the, well, all the, com the compelling storytelling that you're trying to convey. I guess where games and film are converging, yeah. isn't it? So yeah. games yeah, directors and As games designers, we're faced with that problem all the time. Bet, yeah. We build these worlds that you can literally you know, play with and walk around with. There's <coughs> always that challenge of, how, how, as a director, how do you make, make sure people see this thing from a particular angle that's controlled? Right. And the exciting thing for me is that we're, we're, we're asking these questions and we're having to come up with mm -hmm. new solutions. <coughs> where, you know, when, when, if I'm in VR, why am I a person in VR? Why can't I be an interesting camera or something? You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of playing out the perspective of things. So yeah. there's so much scope for new, you know, new stuff in that field. Yeah. Um, it's really exciting. I think also that there's been footage online recently where they've been using, going back to this issue about um, how to make uh, patients with dementia feel safe in a hospital environment because it's divided at the moment now. It's a social services disease, not an NHS disease. But the one thing that I was uh, amazed at was that um, because the part of the brain that responds to music is the last part to be affected by dementia, and that Oliver Sacks did a really interesting chapter on this on his Music Affilia book, the moment when my mother was on an open ward in Nine Wells, if I put on uh, headphones and played Mozart or George Michael to her, she was fine. She was okay. 
because she was no longer receiving information that she was trying to process. She was receiving information that she was familiar with. And I think that in the same way that the virtual reality kit gives you the opportunity to miniaturize your surgical team and, and walk around a tumor or explore a circulatory system, another part of it that could be really helpful is finding ways of making it that people no longer find the hospital environment frightening or, or mystifying or terrifying because I think you know there, there, there is room in that area to, to develop uh, a, a kind of to develop appeal for the environment in the way that you develop appeal for a character but I don't know if you think that would influence what the process was in terms of diagnosis or treatment or certainly the the UK uh, the, the the National Center for Universities and Business has just kicked off a, a two-year-long task force looking at digital health with a particular focus on mental health uh, because there are these these very very large opportunities for you know for the use of, of of games and animation and in fact one of the three threads in that is 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 exactly uh, games and virtual environments in in healthcare the challenge is is partly one of getting it bedded into healthcare practice. Obviously, it's a very, very risk-averse world. Any uh, psychiatrist or any mental health worker will not want to make the process of healthcare in any way dependent on an external party. So there is a real challenge there in terms of, of, of trying to get something bedded in, in, a, you know, in a big way. I think what's likely is there'll be a halfway house where there'll be um, software and sort of animation tools that are seen as not detrimental and might be helpful, maybe, but they'll, they'll never get, I don't think, that, that hard rubber stamp. There is, there is great progress at the moment in the field of the study of autism. I don't know if any of you have seen this film that's about to be released about the boy who developed autism at the age of three and that those parents couldn't communicate with him until they discovered that if they communicated with him as a Disney villain or a Disney character, so his name is Suskind, and his father's a journalist, and there's a... a it's it's a life animated. Life animated. It's, it's, it's being reviewed at the moment. It's due out over here. But <coughs> Nigel Newbert, who's the guy who invited me to teach down at Greenwich, has been working with people in Michigan uh, on the ways in which uh, gaming <coughs> technologies, including the new VR kits, can... Uh, normalize is the wrong word, but can stabilize a lot of the things that are off-putting or, or nerve-wracking for people on the autistic spectrum. And uh, I, I guess that may be one of the side doors through which they manage to, to, to make that less yeah. daunting. Autism is a really interesting issue because obviously um, you can have proxies for real people, or in fact you can have uh, quite, quite similar life models of those real people, and that then makes that person much more familiar to the people who have autism and that, and that eases the conversation in itself. So I think that's certainly one of the more fruitful avenues, that and probably mental health around anxiety issues uh, linked in with cognitive behavioral therapy. I think they're probably the most lucrative ways forward in the... In the Mal, Mal, you were about to say something. Slightly, slightly, a slight tangent. Um, I think we're all you know, fully aware of the the wonderful effect animation has, you know, on people. You know, we're all, for sure we're all big fans of animation and the vi visual, visual communication in general. But I guess what, one problem is that how do we communicate that to people externally who, who do put a number on it? And it's, oh, it's the shiny thing. It's this kind of little, it's a little end thing, and, you know, the thing you do at the very end, which should never be. It should be a part of the whole process from the very, very start especially when you're communicating communicate something as important as you know, health and well-being. And it's very difficult to kind of tackle that appropriately. Um, I, I kind of think that a lot of that has to do with how we view education. Uh, I think that in the existing system, uh, one of the things I used to find when I, was, when I was a kid was that there was no form of physical exercise that was seen as non-competitive. Everything, if you were a guy, if you were a boy in the 1960s and the 1970s, you had to go out on the uh, playing field in winter to play rugby, even if you were going to die in the process. <laughs> you know, that, and the, the, here was a sport where, for somebody who liked to sit in the corner coloring things in, the minute you got the ball, <laughs> twenty-four other people tried to kill you uh, in the winter. So there was no that you couldn't be a dancer if you were a boy. You couldn't be a. Um, you can't be a scientist and an artist. You can't be a musician. But I, I think 
the, this idea that they're exploring in Finland where you just get rid of that idea of the compartmentalization and take the more holistic approach to it. A lot of the fear that I, uh, it's crazy to be hired. I spent most of the last year teaching drawing in Norway and most of what I have to deal with is fear. And the first thing that people say after the first couple of sessions is, you put my work on the wall and I, I, I didn't want to be in the room while you were talking about that, and, but you said nice things about it. And I'm thinking, you've spent the last 20 years and all anybody has done is take your pictures and make fun of them, you know? Or that just this idea that our educational approach is one of positivity as opposed to control. Because a huge part of structured compulsory education is about be in that place for 45 minutes, doing this, move to the next place, do that, do that. It's very, very uh, disjointed and, and every new government that comes in tries to mess with it. And this whole issue of trying to reintroduce visual literacy in any form, I think it's, it's interesting that it was ever edged out because people used to be much more visually and literally. You've still got this big hangover that the arts is kind of this frivolous thing that drawing is a hobby basically and you know I definitely grew up with that where when I tried to persuade my folks to let me go to art school they're like oh no you can do that in your own time you know go and, go and do a proper subject. And instead you did a proper subject like <laughs> philosophy <Yeah>. yay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that's you know that's very much still ingrained in the educational <laughs> system. <laughs> no, 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 that's not what we meant. That's not what, sorry. <laughs> Well, I've lost my train of thought now, but yeah, that's we're still. That you were saying that it, uh, the, the art was a, it was a subject that yeah. w wasn't that you. Yeah, yes. so I think we're still we're still trying to persuade the people who make the decisions about way the way education is taught in Scotland um, is you know still have that mindset essentially. Does anybody have? Any, I, I don't want to shut everybody out of the panel. Thing. It, it, questions for anybody so far for any of the. Must be something. Or yes. Well, since we were talking about health and animation in general, I actually wanted to hit a bit different side of that, more about the health of the animators, um, and taking that from the physical problems as of RSI and stuff like that to all the mental issues you can have with with the pressure and the, you know, it is quite, a, let's say, demanding um, art. And how would you approach? Do you want to start on that? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of it is just your own personal sort of view of how you take care of yourself. Some people take better care of themselves than others do. Um, it's interesting to me when I go to functions and I see people that I haven't seen in anywhere from five to ten to 15 years and see, you know, the, the ravages of time and what it's done. And I'm sure they're looking at me going, Jesus Christ, you know, what happened to this guy? Um, but, but I think um, there's a balance. And I think anybody who works with a computer all the time, you have to take care of your eyes. Like you have to stop looking at the screen. Um, when I go home from a day at the office and happily in my job, I tend to do a lot of different things. I don't just sit and stare at my monitor all day long. Um, I try not to just jump right on my computer. I usually give myself a good four or five minutes of doing something else before I jump back on the computer. <laughs> and then, because your eyes just, they get weird. And um, I need glasses now. And I like to blame the computer, not my age. <laughs> so um, I think there's that. And then, you know, people get carpal tunnel. There's a lot of physical things that can be related with repetitive actions that you do when you're moving a mouse and things like that. Um, there's been times where, like, we Blue Sky ideas about how to interact with a computer. And that's still something I think there's tons and tons of, of opportunities for new ways to input your demands into this device. But I always like the idea of having, I always called it like an animation ball, where you just had this thing you could grab and you can move it in space and it would do something in real space, right? That would be so awesome. Like if you got a bouncing ball, you just go doink, doink, doink with your ball and it's done. You know, that would be so Back cool. To puppetry, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about in the gaming? But I, games? I don't know what else, you know, other than, you know, eat lots of vegetables. <laughs> but is, is that. Yeah, yeah, look out the windows. Yeah. I, th I think it's a problem across both fields. And I think, in health yeah. and uh, as well, the, the, there's the kind of contradiction that you're keeping other people healthy and ruining your own health at the same time. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's something that you need to be very aware of. Yeah. And you, know, you mentioned the word union earlier, and it's the kind of stuff where in, in, in games, there, you, you don't have unions. You know, all these big companies that tend to be big international companies do not allow the, even the notion of a union. 
But there are, there are um, communities that are being set up. Uh, our collective is that in some ways. I'm also part of IGDA, uh, the Game Developers Association. So I'm part of that board. And we try and at least talk about these things because even the conversation is not allowed. You know, so even just talking about crunch and looking after yourself and that kind of stuff is really, really important. A lot of games have been beat up because, you know, they demand people to do like these 80, 90 hour weeks and it's relentless. Uh, it, it kills the employee like it really does. It takes so much out of them. When I worked in commercials, when we came off Roger Rabbit, uh, and th this is actually something to be, be, be beware of because you guys are sitting ducks for the companies that know you want the work so badly, you'll do anything. Uh, one of the things in London that was really noticeable, at the end of Roger Rabbit, there were two or 300 people who suddenly were chasing after 12 available jobs because the industry in London was tiny. And if you wanted to animate in London, you had to do breakfast cereal commercials, period. I mean, the guys at Clacto uh, would they have done- They were good fun. Yeah, they were, they were good fun. But the longest shift I ever worked was on a commercial for a Spanish client and I started drawing at 7.30 on a Wednesday and at 5.30 on a Friday, having worked through two nights, my colleagues got a taxi for me and sent me home because I was <laughs> singing to keep myself awake. I was, I was literally just sitting there going, I don't know, but I've been to, and they were just like, okay, it's time to put you in a cab. But around the community of animation companies in London at the time, Dave was talking about the first version of Beauty and the Beast that Disney were doing. They pursued that originally with a Canadian animator called Dick Purdom and his wife, Jill. Now, Jill was known, she's retired now, as is Dick, but all through the community of animation companies in London in the 80s and 90s, people wanted to work at Purdom's. Why? Because nobody ever did overtime. Why? Because nobody had to. Why? Because Jill actually knew what she was doing and organized it so that, that shit didn't happen. She was able to do that because her father was Gerald Thomas. Have you ever seen a Carry On film? So he's the guy who created the Carry On films. Her brother's Jeremy Thomas, who's the producer of The Last Emperor. And her whole family are animation producers. And they're good animation producers. And they're respected animation producers. And when James Williams came over to Norway to this event, he was singing the praises of Alison Abati. And Alison was the producer on Space Jam, but also on Corpse Bride. Everyone who's ever worked for Alison or Jill they will walk over broken glass to get to work with them again because they don't let people f fry. They don't let people burn out or they do everything in their power to prevent it. It's well it. documented now how much your productivity starts to trail off after about eight hours work. So you end up doing an all-nighter and actually if you just got up an hour early the next day and done the same work, you'd have probably got it done much better. There's a lot of kind of being sensible about what the hours you work. That's exactly on. why when we were doing the animation base camp in the summer, all through July and August, where these 15 people, 13 of them, were doing uh, editing, story, visual development, character design. Two of them were trainee production coordinators. And in most contexts, I didn't get to meet or talk to a producer forever until I was way into it. And they were able, at the beginning of their career, to be in a big open plan space where the people who were the story artists understood how much pressure was on the production coordinators to get a viable diary or calendar of stuff that they could meet without working 14 hour shifts. So the other, the reason that we're so keen through the centrifuge to bring in producers, production managers, all the stuff that doesn't sound terribly sexy, but actually has a massive importance in terms of whether you're gonna have a career that you enjoy over a long period or something that's gonna burn you out by the time you're 30. The other thing I would point you towards is go to awn.com and go to uh, the interview with Scott Ross that was done at FMX in Stuttgart in 2015. And he has a two-part interview all about the broken organizational and financial model of the visual effects industry and why people fry themselves to finish a movie like Life of Pi and then the company goes bankrupt. It's a really interesting thing. Um, yes, hello. On, on the same topic, that's slide from different angle, do you feel, um, for the um, gentleman from uh, Biome, uh, do you feel that, get, in fact, game jams are encouraging bad behaviour then by suggesting that people spend 48 hours constantly working on a game to, from beginning to end, or do you think it's just a bit of fun? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, game jams, if anyone has not heard of them before, essentially, yeah, it's... You stay awake for 48 hours and well, make a game. Well, <laughs> essentially, but I think that uh, game jams have come a long way since, since then, and actually most, especially ones in uh, academic circles at universities where they're hosted, they will encourage you to go, to, to go home and get some sleep. 
Um, so that's also well, you that's tag team, right? You tag team a little bit. Everybody does their totally. bit, but it, totally. it overlaps. It's a it collaboration. Totally, it's a collaboration. Yeah. So, but there is that kind of macho element that kind of creeps yeah. in, unfortunately, where it's like, no, I, I'm passionate about this. I want to go the extra mile. But that is being addressed slowly. So, um, yeah. It also depends how long you're doing it. If you're doing 48-hour shifts for a long period of time, it's going to do you in. But I know back in the early days of our studio, we used to really like doing all-nighters now and again. There's a lot of camaraderie around it. and it's. But as long as you're not asking people to do that over and over again, you know. And I think also as you get older, I cannot do an all-nighter now. If I do, it kills me for about three days afterwards. Whereas when I was in my 20s, I actually enjoyed it and would work all day and then go and do club visuals in the club at night and get up and work the next day and it's all fine. But yeah, time takes its toll. <laughs> do you find that in your environment there's a... Well, I was about to say, I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly the, the recent Game Jams we've run, where, where we've had total control, we, we have actually stopped the students, stopped people getting involved and sent them out of the room overnight and brought them back in. So I think we have a, you know, there's a duty of care element here. Um, you know, the problem is if, if you don't manage it properly, then you can actually lead to a detrimental process. Two members of the group stay up all night, the other three have got sense and go home and they come back to a mess in the morning. So I think, I think if, if you were looking to run game jams or get involved, you know, really try and do a, a, a not, not more than 12 hours probably in a day, it really isn't useful. Um, and certainly as, as an academic, yes, there are times where you have to push it to hit a deadline, but it's not worth doing it on a, you know, on a sustainable basis. Yeah, on a constant the, the, basis. That's where yeah, it gets really, yeah. really detrimental. Because you just become less and less productive. The quality of what you produce is just, you know, worse and worse. And, and it really isn't worth it. Sometimes the best thing you can do is nothing at all. <laughs> you get into that cycle of actually you're, all you're doing is fixing the mistakes you just yeah. made. That's a bad place to be. One other thing that, that crossed my mind, that, that, that it's purely by chance or coincidence that I've wound up doing this teaching work in, in Norway, but one of the things that we've been trying to do is we, we, we deliberately made it, we started work on the animation base camp uh, before the Brexit vote, uh, and we're thinking in terms of how to attract European funding for next year's base camp, but also in real terms for an economy the size of Scotland, to be developing uh, visual effects and animation studios, companies, properties, and not bothering to try and co-produce or work alongside pl places that are really just an hour away, like Oslo or Trondheim, where there's a fantastic tradition of stop frame, really good tr uh, current tradition of visual effects in, in, in Oslo. There are lots and lots of things that we could be doing collectively. And we also partnered with the people in Ireland. What the Irish animation industry has done that's really clever is they formed a trade association called Animation Ireland and they are now lobbying both education and government uh, and they have a guy called Gareth Lee who is positioned between education, industry and government to carry the information to all points of the compass. But the remarkable thing, I was sitting with a uh, guy who runs an animation festival in Norway, a guy who runs a, a studio, a woman who works for one of the funding agencies and I was saying to them, I've been working here for less than a year you have six or seven companies, tops, doing work of this kind. You have five or six colleges teaching. Why are you not talking to one another? Because sitting in the colleges, they're not sure what the companies want. Sitting in the companies, they're frustrated. That I'm like, this is, and one of the guys at one of the visual effects companies said, are you saying that I have a responsibility to do this as well? If you're going to whine at me about the fact that the students aren't coming, yeah, you do, because who else is going to carry that message? <coughs> it's weird that people who work in the communications industries, even inside a particular production or a production company, don't talk to one another. And I think that that's one of the, the really big issues surrounding the production of these on any scale, whether it's a, a game or a visualization tool or a, a, a movie or any of these things is the the key to making it successful and to making it work is to you know take your own medicine follow your own instructions communicate and the more that you understand about what the other people in the process do and what the issues are that they face uh, and the more they come in and see what you're you're busy with then everybody begins to be uh, there's a reciprocal problem solving that goes along uh, it go, goes hand in hand as opposed to it being competitive or whatever and i think part of that 
um, for those of you who are students and starting out, is thinking about um, other business schools in Dundee who are, you know, there might be people who are learning business that are like watching manga or whatever that could be your future business partners or whatever. So it's the, the thing that a lot of small companies do is they start off with two creatives and you're both good at creating stuff, but you don't have a scooby about business. And that's basically where, where I started. And that makes the learning curve doubly hard. My advice to my kind of former self is to team up with a third person who's got that kind of business savvy. Mm -hmm. One thing I'm trying to encourage when I speak to kind of folk from universities and stuff is say other networking events you could coordinate with business schools so artists and business graduates are kind of start hanging out at an early age, you know, kind of. Um, but I think the, yeah, it's just, it's, I think a lot of us go into it with a kind of really kind of naive sense that all I need is a good idea, basically. And if I show someone my brilliant idea, they'll want to make it. And it just doesn't work like that. You know, it's it's all about it's your track record is equally important. So you need to be able to I mean, you can start off and figure it out yourselves from the ground. But if you once you get into trying to get serious money behind things, you really need someone with a track record <coughs> in board. So you need to build those relationships and those relationships take a long time to sort of develop trust with someone that you know you can actually go into business with. So. With, with networking events, we was one in Manchester recently the same time as CTN and those are great for networking but that's usually through like it's the love of the actual art and the, it's mm -hmm. the craft of the other artists where at C even at CTN you don't really need the little producers and yeah. kind of like say financiers and um, you know, someone who'd want to be a business partner or someone. Um, or an accountant for a foundation company, so yeah. there's a, that kind of vacuum where I don't see people I think also there's the, there's the hangover from the idea that animation is a, is a, a, a one person I endeavour. I mean when I started teaching in 2000 every course that I went into, if I went into a final year studio with 24 students, there were 24 films. I mean please you know, uh, you know, and then they, they would say, well, why are the films a bit shaky? And you think, well, duh. It's like trying to get somebody to play every instrument in the orchestra and wondering why it sounds a bit crap. Um, but the idea that we, we, we have a massive problem throughout Europe with the idea of how we define art and how we define cinema and how we personalize it and whether it's about our culture. We had an amazing thing happened while we were trying to get the base camp going where I was telling the story of uh, somebody having spoken to one of the big CEOs of one of the animation companies over there who had mistakenly thought, he said, oh, well, we had some Scottish people here. You know, they, they, were, they were really well informed. They asked lots of fantastic questions. They'd really done their homework and they, yeah, they, they went away and they got that Game of Thrones thing. And the guy was like, that was the Northern Irish people, that wasn't Scottish people. So, oh, well, you know, people with funny accents. <laughs> so I was telling that anecdote to one of the funding people and they went, my God, is that all we are to these people in America, that these big American corporations think of us as people with funny accents? I went, that's exactly how they think about us. They want to know whether you, are the person on the other side of the table, do they read the Hollywood Reporter? Do they read the Financial Times? Do they read for Variety? And besides, they're actually a Japanese corporation, not an American corporation, so do the fucking homework. It's not a question of whether you're offending somebody's personal or cultural s uh, sensibilities by suggesting that their particular idea is maybe not going to make it into the final mix. If you're still at that point where at the academic level people are being given university degrees in a subject that they effectively, at the industrial level, know absolutely nothing about, we've got a real issue to get past, which is that we've got to recognize that it is an industry. It's an industrial process. It's a manufacturing process. It's a process. It's not one person sitting in their bedroom waiting to be discovered. And if we could do ourselves that favor of moving away from that and do ourselves the favor of moving towards the idea that we really want to get out there and compete in this area. We don't want to go out and be plucky little Scotland. There was a sector review <coughs> Creative Scotland ran this year, this, the results of which have still not been published. I was unable to attend the event that they, the, the, they hired a consultancy company who in turn hired a room that only held 20 people and had a meeting that lasted only three hours and that was their sector review. And they phoned some people and they called me and every question, every question, eventually I said, look, please, every question you have asked me is about Scottish animation. Just stop it. I said, the last thing you want is for anybody to say, here comes a bit of Scottish animation. 
You want people to say, here comes a piece of kick-ass animation. Oh, it was done in Scotland. You want it that way round. You don't want something walking into the room with a Jimmy hat on going, hey, I'm as good as Pixar. It's like, <laughs> nobody gives a shit. They just want to know if it's good. Is it good? And there are things in design that are the equivalent of basic hygiene in surgery. <laughs> the basic thing with a story in a feature film is the same as trying to keep the patient alive on the operating table. You don't, and the great Billy Wilder, his one commandment of, uh, of movie making, thou shalt not bore. <laughs> and a lot of the stuff that we produce, when, we, when the Sony people saw the work that was sent to them from the shortlist, they came back to us and went, they do know we make funny films at Sony because a lot of this is really depressing stuff. And if you go around a lot of the animation festivals, a lot of graduate work is very dark and very depressing, which is fine. But if it's all that way, then you're not going to be, you know, m movies that, that make people laugh have a purpose. They're, they're, no, they're not trivial. But the, on, the, on the sort of organizational side of it, and the, that we can't begin to teach the procedural and practical and logistical and financial side of it if we're not still prepared to accept that it's an industrial process, so. Yeah, and I, and I think um, in, in people who have graduated, like myself, who are still in university, for the most part, I think everyone identifies as being self-taught. And, you know, you see uh, studios like the Moon Mission, we've the fourth, they were bought, um, with movies like, you know, Swift on Me, and you have like, the Lego movie, which being being made for like 50, 60 million compared to like 240 Frozen, you know, 240 million Frozen. So, the fact that we, these things can be done with smaller budgets, and like you said, with games, how Mal was saying, Maya and you know all these um, computers that can run it, they, you know, they're not, you know, you can't anyone in their house can get them if they save up, you know, a couple of their wages. You know, it's it's accessible. So my question is like, what can be done either t to convince either the boards or the council who have who have money, or or basically just like anyone just to kind of change the perception of how they see animation so that people here can make studios like you know, Illumination within the UK and make feature films that are of you know, a worldwide quality. You know, just look at me, like, it's not my cup of tea, but they can't deny how successful it's been. And it's made compared to you know, a Disney or a Pixar on a dime budget. So I think that can be done here. So it's just what are the steps? I, t I totally agree with you. So. And I guess, I guess, you know, as much, you know, I love animation, but my focus is definitely games. And I was lucky enough about three years ago. Your industry is now bigger than the movie industry. Yeah, so. yeah totally. Yeah, so we're king. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was lucky enough about three years ago to visit a bunch of different studios uh, internationally, including Pixar. And I realized then it was very evident to me that we do have the talent here, but we just don't have the, the, the financing. We don't have the money here. We don't have the same culture of super positive people, you know, business people selling things that might not be that great, but they bring the money and they make it great, right? We don't have that level of support here. However, what, what we're trying to do uh, in, in Dundee is trying to, we're just trying to make awesome stuff. Just make good stuff as much as you can, and that will lead to bigger and bigger things. We also need a lot of representation on, the, on, on kind of to, to, to engage government, local and a national government, and that takes a lot of effort, unfortunately. We're, within games, we're having to do that with volunteers on, you know, serving in different boards or whatever. But it's, it's, it's a continued conversation. That it's very slow, it's very, very slow, and it's stuff that people are doing off their own backs. But hopefully, it will, it will create a shift. Yeah. We're, we're, we've been doing the same thing. We've been to CTN the last two years running. We want to get political policy makers and college managers to come with us. There's no point there of taking our word for it, <coughs> for it that it's a, a, a good idea. But the other thing about what Mal's saying about the visit to Pixar, Pixar, remember, it started out doing Listerine commercials and orange juice commercials. How did they get to Toy Story? Steve Jobs, who poured millions into the company to stop it from going belly up. People, how many of you watched the first part of the Disney documentary? It's a documentary about Walt Disney. We wouldn't be having a conversation about Walt if Roy hadn't been there. Roy was the, 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 these successful entities are always a balance between the creative and the commercial. And, they're, and they're, they have to be a realistic balance between the two and a mutually respective balance between the two. And we even you know, where we do teach business, we need to be teaching, because if you're producing a game, it's a different thing to being a producer for a movie. 
If you're producing an animated movie, it's different to being a producer of an animated TV series, and so on down the line. These are very specific skills, and also they change each year. Totally. The face of the health industry, the face of the education industry, these things, it's convenient for a college to want a curriculum to stay fixed. But if it's a curriculum relating to the games or the movie or the visualization industries, dream on, because it's going to have to develop each, each year. We're, how are we for time? Can I, can I just say one big thank you to everybody for giving up whatever else you would have been doing with your afternoons, but could you please say a very warm thank you to Jim, to Mal, to Dave, and to Will. And also, and also to Julie Craik, without whom none of this would have happened. Thank you so much indeed.